joining me for episode 25 of My Doll's House Diary. Now in today's episode I'm going to be making a start in the second bedroom up here and I've chosen a lovely teal green colour scheme. Once again I'm going to be going for one painted wall and possibly one or two papered walls. I'll see how much wallpaper I've got. But let me start by showing you the paper, paint and the fabrics that I've chosen for this room. So this is the wallpaper I've chosen and it's like a little teal green vine leaf and then a pale grey feather. So I've got two sheets of that and I want to do one wall, the back wall, and then the chimney breast and then the, the main wall or the larger wall and the walls at either side of the chimney breast will be in the paint colour and I'll be using the chimney breast that I took out of the red bedroom that used to be in that top right corner. So I'll strip all of the paper off of this and funnily enough when I just dried it back in the room it was a little bit too tall. So again it's that sort of MDF, I used a piece of um, shelf from a shelf unit that we dismantled and I just cut out a section in it. So it's that MDF wood and I think that's probably just swollen since I've taken it out. So I'll need to shave a little bit off the top of there and it was only a, a millimetre or so I just couldn't quite stand it up so I'll do that and then the paint I've gone for is a Wix own make and it's called teal number 940 teal and let me show you that on a little piece of lining paper so a little sample there on some lining paper which I've just stuck to my worktop and this is the lining paper that's actually in the room so I know that'll be the exact colour and I actually want to try and darken this up a little bit because I want it to match a lovely silk fabric that I've bought so we'll have a go at that as well. I'll be using the wooden strip flooring again and I'll be doing the same thing that I did for the study floor so I'll be creating a cardboard template and then stripping these apart, these are on a self-adhesive backing and then reapplying them to the cardboard template which I think looks more natural and then I'll be finishing those in a walnut wood die and again there's a little sample of it and that's two coats but I'll also be adding a coat of clear varnish over the top to give it a nice sheen and I'm using the Rustin's walnut wood die I'll be using the same coving as I did um, in the study and I'll be using this particular coving throughout. That's got a really nice little detail to it. And I just used a plain skirting in the kitchen and the study, but I thought I'd go for something a little bit more fancy for the bedroom. I'm just trying to angle it so you can see the sort of shape in there. So that's got a nice little detail at the top there and I'll be using that in both of the bedrooms. So I've got plenty of these strips to do that with. And then I'm, I haven't got the paint here, but I'm going to go for a nice ivory paint for the furniture. And I thought that would look really nice against the green, but also against the dark wood flooring. Okay, let me tidy these away and I'll show you the fabrics I've got. So these are the fabrics I've chosen and I've gone for this lovely teal green silk and I've got two pieces of that and then I've just got a piece of teal green and white check just as a bit of a contrast and then some plain white cotton fabric. And I did want something with a bit of a pattern in it but I was having real trouble finding something with a teal pattern. So what I'm actually going to do is print the wallpaper onto fabric. And I've got this photo fabric here, which you just put through your printer. So you save an image of your wallpaper or whatever pattern you want to use. And then you would print it out onto these fabric sheets. So we'll also try and have a go at that later. Looking forward to doing that. And then I just want to show you that silk against the paint sample. So as you can see it's a pretty good match but the paint just needs to be a little bit darker so I'm going to have a go at darkening that up with a bit of dark blue paint which I've also got here so we'll have a go at that in a moment. 
And then I've also been working on a crocheted blanket, which will go along the end of the bed. Probably going to make this four by nine, so that will consist of 36 squares, and that will be a double bed runner, so we'll just go along the bottom of the bed. And I couldn't find the colour I wanted in my usual DMC Special Dentels cottons, and they're the ones I sell in the shop. So I've actually gone for a Venus thread, and this is Venus Shade 372, and in thickness they're very similar to the Special Dentels number 80 thread. So if you wanted to combine the two, you can. And Venus are similar in shades to the Special Dentels, but there are just a couple of shades slightly different, so they're really nice to use as contrasts. And for the bed, whereas I'd normally build a sort of traditional bed with a, a wooden frame, I'm actually going to do a fabric headboard, sort of like a buttoned fabric headboard using this lovely silk. So we'll be doing that at a later stage as well. So another thing I've done here is just made, made a list of everything that needs doing in the bedroom and the order in which it needs doing. Now I've already painted the ceiling in there, I did all of those at the same time if you remember. So the first thing I need to do is paint the window and I want to make a cardboard template for the flooring. Then I can make a start on that whilst the window paint is drying and then we'll mix the paint for the walls. So hopefully when we come to paint the walls the window paint will be nice and dry. So it's just a question of thinking what you need to do, what order it needs to be done in, jot it down and then you can just keep referring back to your list. But we've got a lot to do here, so we'd better get started. So for the window and for the coving and skirting, I'm going to be using this antique white paint. So it's not quite a bright white, it's sort of like an off-white. Now I had two pots of this and both of them had gone a little bit dry. So I mixed them together and then I just added the tiniest little drop of water and then mix that in and that's now a nice consistency. Okay so let's make a start on this window and I'm not using this brush but I'm just cleaning off the paint. And I'm actually just going to use this small number six brush and that's about six millimeters or quarter of an inch and as well, because this room's over on the right and I'm right-handed, it's quite difficult to get into. And originally I used a Humbrol enamel on these windows and that was called Ivory. And then over time that went really yellow, as you can see, as I'm sort of putting that white paint against it. This is definitely going to take a couple of coats. And I'd already sanded this window down um, when I was working on the room before. I've got a little bit on the acetate there, but the good thing about that is that you can actually just scratch that off. when it's dry, so I'm not too worried about that. And I think this is going to look really nice against that lovely teal green paint as well. So I'm making a template for the wooden flooring so and I'm just using cereal packet card. So I've got a couple of pieces here which I've obviously flattened out and then I've drawn a line underneath this lip where I need to cut. But I also want to cut this piece so that it lays beside that piece. Try not to have an overlap or you'll find that you'll have a bit of a lump in the flooring. So I'll cut these to size and then I'll stick them together with masking tape. So let's take these back into the craft room. 
Okay, so I've joined those two pieces together with a piece of masking tape and that now fits in there nicely. So even after you've joined it, always just make sure that it fits in nicely before you actually start attaching the wooden strip flooring. And I'm quite lucky in this room because I haven't got any doors in there, so I haven't got anything at all sticking out into the room, so it's just a lovely square piece. But if you did have door surrounds attached, obviously you need to take those into account when you're making your template and just cut a little bit out so that you can then lay the strip wood around them. So I'm going to start stripping apart the flooring strips now. Now I've done a whole video on this technique and that was my Doll's House Diary tutorial number 15 and I went over how I fitted the flooring for the study and I just do it this way because I think it gives a more natural look than all these sort of really tightly laid strips on the sheet. And once you've um, painted it or applied wood dye, you can't even see the joins in the strips. So that's why I like to redo it. But if you'd like to see me actually using this technique, then do have a look back at that um, tutorial number 15 and I'll put a link to that at the end as well. So I'm gonna strip these apart, but then before I start attaching them to my template, I'm going to go and give that um, window another coat of paint. So that's now three coats of paint on the window frame and that's given a really nice coverage. So I'm going to leave that to dry and I've also finished the strip wood flooring sheet and that looks really good in there. Really nice fit as well. So whilst that window paint is drying I'm going to give the flooring the first coat of wood dye and then we'll start mixing those paint colours to get the correct shade of teal green. So the important thing when you're using wood dye is to give it a really good shake before you use it. Otherwise, all the sort of colour sits at the bottom and you just get a horrible sort of wishy-washy orangey stain on your wood. So I've given it a good shake and I've dispensed some into a pot just because I don't want to have to keep dipping my brush into the tin. And even when you do that, just make sure that every so often you just pick it up and give it a bit of a slosh around like that, just to keep it mixed. And I'm not using a massive brush, just because I want to be able to work it in between the um, gaps as well. I don't want any natural wood showing. I actually really enjoy using wood dye. It goes on so easily. And a little goes a long way as well. I'm probably going to be doing a couple of coats, if not three, on here. Because I want a really lovely rich colour. Really deep colour. And then like I said earlier, I'll be doing that coat of clear varnish over the top. Just to give that a nice sheen. And to seal it all as well. I'm going back to sort of a really classic look with this room with the dark flooring and the ivory or off-white furniture. And I want the furniture to have a classical look as well. So that's two coats of wood dye now on the flooring and I just did those one coat after another. I didn't leave any drying time in between but I really like how that looks so far. And when you're sort of applying a darker wood onto natural wood, sort of turn your head and look into all the little gaps and already I've spotted a couple where you can see a little bit of natural wood coming through like that one just there. 
So when I do the next coat, I'll go along and make sure I work the brush into those gaps and check along the sort of long gaps as well. And I didn't do along the front edge, I've just realised. So I'll do that as well with the next coat. And I'll just apply coat after coat until I'm really happy with the colour. I want it to look a little bit richer than this. So once that's dried, I'll be able to get a better idea of what two coats of walnut looks like. Yeah, but I like that so far. So now I want to try and mix a deeper teal colour and then we can get some paint on the walls. So I've been playing around with paint colours here just because I want to make this jade colour a little bit darker. So I thought that it would do it just by adding a bit of um, dark blue, the Admiral Blue. But that was making it a little bit too blue and when I hold the silk against it it really looks like blue and I don't really know if you can see that on camera. So I brought out some more green shades and the shade I actually like is this one and this is the jade, so the original jade colour with a little bit of that dark blue there like that, and then a bit of this Dulux emerald green thrown in just to keep it as a green colour rather than a blue. So I'm really happy with that one and as that's drying that's turning into a really nice colour. So I'll go and find a pot and then we'll mix a little bit in there and then get it on the walls. So I've got a nice little plastic tub here and I'm going to mix equal parts of the teal and the emerald glade and then I just added in a little bit of the Admiral. So I've got a piece of lining paper on here that I can keep testing it on until I get to the right colour. And I'm going to use my spoon to make sure that I get equal parts of those two colours. So let's just add in a bit of the teal. So I just want to get a sort of level teaspoon there. And I'll do a couple just because I do want enough for that long wall and then either side of the chimney breast. And then this is one of those little roll-on sample pots. It's a little bit messy actually. I if I can take the top off of that. That makes it a little bit easier. And I can just squeeze some into the spoon quite thick this one. This is an actual Dulux paint so it's probably a little bit better quality than the, the own make. I just wanted to try and get a little bit more out of there to make that first spoonful up to a level teaspoon. Get that off of the brush and then I'm going off the spoon and then I'm going to mix those together and then I just want to add a tiny, tiny bit of the Admiral Blue at a time because that's quite dark and I don't want it to turn it too blue. And then we can have a try on the paper. So let me find a mixer. So that's the teal and the emerald mixed. And then I just want to add a tiny little bit of blue at a time and mix that in and then try it on the paper just until I get that exact colour. sort of see in the pot there that's not going to be quite enough so let me add a little bit more in. And you really do only want to go a little bit at a time otherwise then you've got to keep sort of going to try and lighten it up again. So first little test there. I don't think that's quite dark enough. Almost but not quite so I'll just put a tiny little bit more blue in and it really is just going to be a tiny bit. So I've 
tip of the spoon there. And when you're adding in colours and mixing, you want to make sure that the paint's completely one colour and there's no sort of marbling in there. Otherwise you won't get the true colour actually on the walls. So after adding another tiny little bit of blue, we're now there, and there's the colour. And I'm pretty sure that's going to be enough for those two walls in there. So I'll get cleaned up in here, and then we can go and make a start. So I'm going to start off with this smaller brush, just to go along the ceiling and around the window there. And then I'll come in with a larger brush. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit in here with the camera there, so I'll just do what I can. But I may have to just move the camera for a bit. Now I've got a little bit of um, leeway here because I'll have the cove in up the top there, so that will cover any paint I get onto that little bit of ceiling. And obviously the back wall will be papered, so that will be covered as well. But I'm still going to try and be as careful as I can, although <laughs> at this angle it's not very easy. Already love that colour. I don't normally go for bold colours like this. I just saw that, um, actually the wallpaper first of all, with that lovely little teal green detail in it. And I thought, yeah, let's go for green. Let's do something a little bit different. And I never used to like green, but I'm sort of starting to become more of a fan of green. So this sort of central section of the wall, probably from about here downwards and then from about here, will be covered with the um, chimney breast. And that was the one that I originally took out of here. So I don't need to paint in that central bit there. Right, I, I do think I'm going to have to move the camera now, just get in properly around the window. So I'll be back in a min. So I've got the camera stood there on a little tripod. And I hope you can see what I'm doing. <laughs> So that's that side done and I got a bit along the edge of the window frame there but I'm actually going to leave it because once the chimney breast is in place you can't see that so I think I'll make more of a mess of it actually trying to correct that and painting along the edge of the window in white. And again looking a little bit patchy at the moment but we'll see what that looks like when it's dried and see if I have to do a second coat. Now we'll make a start on this long wall over here. So that's one coat now on each wall. And I've been a little bit messy on the ceiling over that side but I'm hoping I haven't come out too far that the coving won't cover that. But if it does, I can do a couple of coats of white over that just to cover. Now again, looking a little bit patchy, so I'm hoping that's going to dry and be a nice, rich, solid colour. But what I'm actually going to do is just going to do another couple of coats of wood dye on the floor and just let this dry off for a bit and then I'll do the second coat rather than leaving it overnight. But I'm pleased with that colour so far. And I'm just sort of picturing what it's going to look like with the wallpaper on that back wall. I think that's going to look really nice. Okay, let's go back in the craft room for a bit. 
So the strip wood flooring has been drying now for a good couple of hours, so that's completely touch dry. And I now want to apply another couple of coats just to make that look a little bit darker, a little bit richer. And then I shall leave that to dry overnight and apply the clear varnish in the morning. So that's another two coats of wood dye on there now and that's still wet so that will probably lighten up a little bit more when that dries but I really love how that's looking and that coat of clear varnish will really add a nice richness to that. So I'm going to put that somewhere safe now to dry. I've also applied a second coat of paint to the walls and I think that's looking a lot nicer colour now and a lot less patchy. That's still not completely dry so we'll come back and have a look at that in the morning. I've put some cling film over the remaining paint so if we need to do any more touching up then I've got a little bit of paint left but really like how that's looking. So I need to take a little bit off the top of the chimney breast. For some reason this wood actually expanded after it was removed from the doll's house. Now it's just been stood in a corner of the breakfast room so that could possibly be why. Maybe it's got a little bit damp or something at some point and the wood has just sort of swelled. I don't know. But I've measured from floor to ceiling in there and then I've taken off a couple of millimetres for the wooden flooring because this will sit on top of it. So I need to take off about three millimetres along that top edge there. Now Matt's down in his workshop today and I've actually heard him using his saw so I'm going to go down and see if he'll just trim that off for me and then I can come back and remove the rest of the paper. Hello. Hello. Would you be able to do me a favour? Yeah. I just wonder if you could just cut a bit ooh, off the top of this. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I've made a pencil mark. Sorry about three. Just along that line there. Three mil. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> See you in a bit. See you later. and easy. So now I just want to try and remove this paper from the front. Let's see if I can get in there with my fingers. So that's the chimney breast stripped and that all came away quite easy. A little bit of the paper backing still left on there but I'm not too worried about that. The paper I've got to cover it is quite thick so you won't be able to see any of that through it. All I did find there was actually a little bit of a chip in the wood and as that's going to be on the side sort of facing out of the doll's house I'm actually going to fill that. So I've got a little bit of um, filler here and you might have seen me use this before. I really like this one. It's a Ron Seal smooth finish filler and it's really lightweight and fluffy. You sort of see there the sort of texture that it is. And because it's so lightweight, it will fill really tiny little cracks. So this is really good for Doll's House Furniture projects and Doll's House Furniture as well. So let me get a little bit of that onto that hole. And it's more the side of there that I want to fill because obviously the back bit will be stuck down and not visible. So I'm going to put that on there quite thickly like that. I don't want to mess around with it too much now because once you start 
messing around you just end up pulling it all out. So that's covered nice and thickly and then once that's dried I can sand that off to leave a nice smooth edge along there. I've just noticed another little dent further down so I'll do the same thing again. Not as big this one. So just I don't want any sort of ripples in the um, wallpaper along that edge because that will be quite noticeable. to one side to dry now. So whilst that fill is drying I want to apply a coat of clear varnish to the flooring sheet but let me first of all just show you how the paint dried in the bedroom yesterday. So I'm really pleased with how that's dried. I think that looks really nice. Now I said to you yesterday that I'd painted all of the ceilings but I'm not sure why I said that. I think I was thinking about the fact that I'd papered them all. I hadn't actually painted them so I just came out this morning and just put a bit of paint on the ceiling up there so that's still damp which is why you can see those bubbles there across the copper tape but again that will shrink back. Sorry if you can hear a whistling in the background that's our washing machine on spin. Makes a bit of an awful noise. So for the flooring I'm using the Rustin's Quick Dry Varnish which is a satin finish varnish. Now when you're applying a clear varnish to a dark surface it's a good idea not to keep putting the brush back in the tin otherwise you'll contaminate the liquid that's in the tin. So I've just dispensed a couple of spoonfuls into this pot and I'll use it from here. Now this particular one when it first goes on it appears a little bit milky but that does dry back so it will it will just dry clear and you won't see any of that sort of white liquid. And already that looks really nice. So I'll apply apply a couple of coats of this, just one after the other, and then I'll leave it to dry and then see if I need to apply a further coat. When you apply a varnish over the top of this wood dye, you really sort of bring out the grain in the wood. I think that looks really nice. So I'm on the second coat now. Looks really good, doesn't it? And I've just had to put another teaspoon of varnish into my pot. So that was three of those sort of large teaspoons all together just to give you an idea of how much you might need and that, that would have done the two coats and as you're working try to be quite methodical so sort of work along three strips at a time and that way you know you're covering everything especially on the second coat when you can't sort of see where you've already been on the first coat it's quite easy to see where you've been And I'll wait and see how it dries but looking at it now I think the two coats is probably going to be enough. Not going to go glossy because it's a satin finish but I just wanted that lovely sort of sheen on it which this is giving. Can't wait to get this in place. It's going to look really nice against that paint as well. I think the two colours are really going to complement each other. Another thing as well I just wanted to say, I've noticed a couple of the floorboards are sort of sticking up in places and that's just where your liquid would have got underneath and worked its way under the sticky strip and obviously taken off the glue so you may need to do a little bit of gluing down at the end. But wait until the end and then you can see which ones are lifting and just put a bit of wood glue underneath and I'll do that once this varnish has dried. I think it's two I've spotted, that one there and there was one over here lifting up at the end but it's flattened down at the moment. So 
So I'll just carry on and use up this little bit that I've got left in the pot because obviously I don't want to tip it back into the tin and then I'll leave this to dry. So my wooden flooring has now been drying for about three hours and that's completely touch dry now. So a final little finishing touch, I'm going to make the little nail holes. And you've probably seen me do this before as well. I would have done this for the study floor. And I'm just using my scribe tool, which is like a pencil with a sharp pointed end. And I just want to punch a couple of little holes in the end of each strip. Really easy to do, but a really nice little detail. And if you find that you um, sort of split the wood as you're doing it, don't worry, because that would happen in real floorboards as well. And I went round before I started this, um, just with a little bit of glue and just stuck down those couple of boards that were sticking up. So that's done as well. I'm just trying the wooden flooring sheet into place so this isn't at all glued in because we need to do the wallpaper on the back wall first. But doesn't that look lovely against that teal green paint? I'm so pleased with that. And when I tried this into place, there was a little bit of polyfiller or something on the floor. So it was actually sticking up in one area. So I just used a chisel and hammer and I got rid of that so that, that lays nice and flat. So always just give it a try first and make sure it's laying completely flat against your floor, just in case of any little lumps and bumps. So I'm now going to make a template for that back wall and then we'll get that wallpaper on and then we can put the floor in into place. I had actually forgotten that I'd kept these but I kept the paper templates I made for the lining paper when I lined the walls of the doll's house and it's basically just scrap paper that I've laid onto the wall and then stuck together to create an exact pattern. Obviously this is quite a straightforward one because it's just a rectangle wall but when you've got windows and doors this is a really good way of making a template for your wallpaper and you just stick the scraps of paper with a straight edge around the outside of your windows and your doors and build up a template like this. So I've drawn that onto the back of the wallpaper using pencil and a rule. And when you're doing that, just make sure that you're not cutting into the little um, label that you'll find on most wallpapers. You'll normally get a maker's name on there and obviously you don't want that sticking on your wall. So either just trim that edge off with your craft knife or just make sure you're not using that edge so I'll cut this out now and then we can get it stuck into place. So even though you've cut from a template, do just try the piece of wallpaper into place just to make sure. And I just cut a tiny little slither of paper off one end just so that laid nice and flat along there. And I'm now going to glue that into place. I like to apply the glue directly to the wall rather than to the paper. I just find that's a lot easier. And I'm just using my Gorilla Wood glue. I find that just works really well when sticking paper. So get a good coverage of glue. I don't want to get any onto the wall, so I'll go along those edges in a moment. And that sealing paper had dried back nicely as well, after a few hours. Always handy when you've got a door that you can put your hand through. <laughs> I think that's completely covered. A couple of bristles coming off there. Just 
trying to pick them out of the, the glue. I don't think they'll show through, but just a little bit annoying. Never pays to buy cheap brushes. You always end up getting bristles left in glue and paint. Okay, so I'm going to bring my paper in now. And this has actually got a right way up, although it looks just like a random pattern. The little um, vine leaves are hanging down. So that's how I'll attach it. So I'm just sort of rolling it into place there. I think I need to go that way a little bit. in place first. And this is a nice thick paper as well. Which you find doesn't tend to crease as much when it's on the wall. It's more like a sort of thin card. Now, unfortunately, the people that I bought this from, or the supplier, I had a really bad time with them. I I was getting short deliveries and um, every time I sort of reported a short delivery, I, I had to have an argument about it because they didn't believe me. They'd asked me to check the box and send it back even though I'd already listed it on the Etsy shop. And it was, it was just a complete nightmare. And in the end, they were sending my orders to the wrong address. Luckily, the postman recognised the name of the company, so he delivered them here. So I'm not going to say where the paper was from because I don't want to have to put you through that. So I'm going to have to find another supplier for these lovely papers. But that won't be a problem. But just look for a really good quality paper. And then you'll find like that, that it just goes on really nice and smooth. Now I am just going to grab the little um, like spreader thing that Matt uses for his vinyl graphics and just go over the wall with that. And that's just like this little padded, um, I don't really know what it is, it's quite spongy. You know, it's flexible like that, little padded thing. And then I can just make sure that it's pressed against the walls and along those edges and that it's sticking in all areas and he uses this for applying vinyl graphics but I find it works really well for wallpaper as well but you could also um, just use a piece of kitchen towel and just go over the whole wall with that just smoothing it all out really and I really like how those little vine leaves stand out against the colour of the paint. Let me move in a little bit there. Am I still in focus there? To me, those vine leaves look almost like an exact match. So really pleased with that. And I just want to try that wooden flooring in place again. Actually, coming back here from this angle with the light, I can actually see a little ripple there. And I've said to you before about using a torch or a light um, when you're painting and shining that on and you can really see where you've missed. And it's the same with this. If you use a torch or a light, you can see if there's any bubbles or anything. I'm really actually pleased with how that's gone on. Normally you'd get creases and things like that that you'd have to try and iron out. But that's not too bad and I think where there are a few lumps it's because the wall at the back isn't even where I sort of pulled off wallpaper and skirting and things like that and it wasn't completely smooth but that looks really nice so let's just try this wooden flooring back in now the paper's there really like how that looks. I think those colours go really nicely together. So I'll go and get some more glue and we can attach the wooden flooring and then weigh that down. And whilst that's drying, I want to start the chimney breast. 
So I've applied the glue directly to the floor and I'm using my brush to just spread that around. I'm not worried about getting it on the bottom of the walls because there's going to be skirt in there, hiding that. So I'm just bringing in the floor in now, making sure it's the right, right way around because I've got some smaller pieces of strip along that back edge. So press that into place. I then just want to cover that with a couple of pieces of kitchen towel just to protect the surface. Just lay those in there like that. And then I'm going to weigh that down with some tins, but before I do so, a tip that I got from a lovely lady here on YouTube was to lay in some ceramic tiles first of all and that way the weight of the tins distributes right into the corners where the flooring would tend to lift up. So I've got a couple more here. And then I'll put a couple of more a couple more tiles just coming out of this end here so they're overhanging but they're quite safe. And once they're weighed down they're not going to oops go anywhere. Right let me go and grab some tins. but these are actually quite heavy so that should do the trick <laughs> the filler along the edge of the chimney breast has now completely dried so I'm going to sand that off and I'm going to start by doing it flat on the work surface like that against my sandpaper And that's smoothing that off really nicely there. So I'll just keep going a little bit longer, just get that really flat. Yeah, that's really nice along there now. And then I'm actually going to put it face down and do this little bit, even though that's on the back, but I want it to be flat so that it's going to lay flat against the wall. So with my hand there, I'm putting pressure down on the bit that I actually want to sand. Yep, and that's done a really nice job there as well. So that little dent in the wood has now gone, so that's nice. Let me clear up this mess. So I've just been through the box of bits that I salvaged from the sort of doll's house renovation and I wasn't sure if I would be using these again but I think this would look really nice in that bedroom so I'm going to use this and this is a resin um, surround really nice detailing on there and it actually came in this sort of yellowed colour so I then bought a hearth to go with it and this is made from plaster so this came and it was bright white and I actually aged it up, you can still see a little bit of evidence of that on there, just using watercolour paints. So I've just tried to clean that off, I just started with um, water and a toothbrush, an old toothbrush but that didn't really do much so I used a little bit of jiff and that took a little bit more off but there is still a little bit of yellowing on there but what I actually want to do is paint these with the enamel in the antique white and I think that will look really nice and then I'm not going to have an actual fire in there because I think because it's a sort of more contemporary house even though I'm going for a traditional style 
People don't tend to light fires in bedrooms anymore, but I did still want to leave the fire surround there just because I think it looks really nice and it's a really nice detail. But what I'll do is I'll add the brick paper at the back there and I'll paint that white and then I'm sort of picturing maybe some vases in there, some really nice vases and jugs in all different sort of shades of teal and green or maybe some dried flowers or something like that. So we'll just sort of dress the fireplace rather than having a fire in there. So I'll pop these to one side for now. And the first thing I want to do is actually add the brick paper to this part of the surround. So I've got a piece here and this is that lovely embossed brick paper that I used on the chimney breast in the kitchen. I'll show you the back there, you can see how that's embossed. And it's this lovely random brick pattern. And even though I'll be painting it, you can still sort of see the shape of the bricks through the paint. So I've cut a piece here that is as high as the opening on my chimney breast. And then I just want to begin by folding it around this first sort of leg, I suppose. So I'll go along the actual grout between the bricks there, so I know I'm getting a straight line. And I'm just creasing it in with my nail there at the bottom of that leg, so flat with my work surface. Now, so let's take it away and fold those in. Fold that in as well. And then turn it around and we want to create that crease along the other edge as well. So make sure it's sort of butted right up against the first leg. And crease it in along there. And then fold that. Make a nice crisp crease in there. And then we can fold it around that final leg there. And again, crease that in. And then you only need a little bit overhanging at each side. So I'm going to trim a little bit of that off. Okay, and just go along the grout between the bricks so you're getting a straight line. And I'll trim a little bit off over there as well. And then I'm just going to apply the glue to the, the side pieces and these flaps here. Don't need to worry about that back piece because we'll glue that when we actually glue the whole thing into place against the wall. So flatten that out like that. I'll just apply the glue in the normal way with my cocktail stick. And I'm applying it to the paper this time just because the inside edges of that chimney breast aren't straight. I said to you earlier that it's that horrible MDF, so it's all sort of bobbly on the inside. If you know what I mean. It's sort of like that chipboard, you know. The other side as well. into place. I was just checking then that I'd got it the right way around. I couldn't remember which way I wanted facing forward, but this is right. So glue that into place. Catching on a little bit in the corner there. And that bit will flatten out when we attach it to the wall. So 
where it is from behind there. So I'm just going to leave that piece to dry. I'll put it over there in that lovely sunny patch. So I want to have a go now at painting the surround. I wanted to do the hearth at the same time, but that's still really wet. And I cleaned that off at lunchtime and it's now quarter to five. So obviously the plaster has really soaked up the water. So again, I've put that on the window ledge in a nice sunny spot to dry. And I'll just have a go at this first. And I'm not sure if I'm going to need to prepare this surface in any other way. I was thinking I might need to sort of key it up with a bit of wire wool or something. But I'll just give it a go and see what sort of coverage we get. And I'd certainly need two or three coats, I would think. That seems to be going on too badly. And on here as well, I'd added some charcoal um, to make it look like soot from the fire. So I'd sort of gone around with charcoal around the opening and along some of the edges. So I cleaned all of that off. That came off nice and easy. Just moved the camera out a bit. I realised I was sort of right in front of the, the lens. These are relatively inexpensive, these little surrounds, and I think they've got some really lovely little details on them. And I had sold these in the Etsy shop, um, in my Etsy shop at one point, and I've been trying to reorder them, but they don't have them in stock and they haven't had for a while. And some of them they've moved even out of the price list now, so I'm just wondering if they're having trouble getting hold of them or whether they just have been discontinued but I'll keep searching because I think these are really nice make a nice detail in the room even if you're not having a fire like I've just spoken of so that's not going on too badly as I'm sort of brushing, I'm taking it off at the same time, so it's definitely going to need this as a base coat and then maybe another two or three coats to give it a, a good coverage. And even just along the side where that first coat had started to dry off, that's going on a lot nicer, so that looks promising. And it's really just to clean it up to make it look clean and bright and a little bit more modern. And I think you would do that in an old house. You'd probably brighten up some of the old fixtures and fittings. So I'm tapping the brush there around all those little details just to get the paint into all the little nooks and crannies. So we haven't got any of that yellow showing through at the end. So that's one very rough coat on there, but it's looking promising. It's still patchy at the moment, but I think two or three coats will do it. And when you're doing something like this, where you're painting over little details like this, wipe your brush off at the end and then go around with a practically dry brush just over the details, just to make sure you haven't got any little clogs of paint sitting in the detail. Otherwise you'll just be hiding them. So just go around all the little nooks and crannies and little details and brush off any sort of excess paint. And we'll do that after each coat. But yeah, I quite like how that looks. So I'll leave that to dry overnight and then hopefully in the morning that hearth will be dry enough for me to give that a coat as well and I think that'll be a lot easier because that's plaster rather than resin. I now want to attach the paper to the chimney breast so I've cut it here so it's as tall as the chimney breast 
and I want to start by folding a piece around on that side. So again, I'm going to crease that line down the edge of the chimney breast, just using my finger. Fold that over and then crease it underneath as well. And press that down against the work surface. Fold those in, make a nice sharp crease. And I made sure that I'd got the paper the right way round. Always check which way your pattern goes before you start cutting. So put the chimney breast back in there. to smooth it out and then do the same on this other side. And then fold it under and do the same again. So I'm really just wrapping the chimney breast up in the paper. See, I want a little bit coming around the back here. So I'm going to cut that off. And there's a little bit of a pattern I can follow there. I'm sort of cutting alongside the vine leaf in that row. But this bit is around the back, so it doesn't have to be perfectly straight. Just sort of put that to one side. And then turn it over again, and we now want to cut out a section, obviously, for the um, chimney breast opening. And again, this is going to be hidden behind that surround, so it hasn't got to be perfectly straight. But you just want it to go back, so I'm just going to go back probably about a quarter of an inch or six millimetres onto each of those leg pieces. I'll just go up there like that. And take care not to tear the piece that you want to keep. to go too high either so there's the opening I can feel it there with my fingers I've just gone about six millimeters above I'll do the same at this side as well I can then fold that back like that and then take that off of there and I can trim that away And then I can glue that into place. And again, I'm going to apply the glue to the paper for this. I just want to put a covering on my cutting mat. I'm still trying to keep it nice and clean. I'm not sure how long that will last. Okay, so I'm going to apply the glue directly to the paper. Not too much on there, just enough to spread out evenly. Now I'll just grab a spreader out of my little pot in my nice neat drawer. <laughs> and then spread that along, making sure you're getting it right along the edges. When you get it off the um, actual paper like that, make sure you don't then put the paper back in the glue. And that's what I normally do. Do a little bit more on that top edge. And let's bring the surround in. And I'll just put it down along that first crease.
and then start folding it back round. You want to just pick that up and make sure it's going along the front nice and flat. That's the bit that is the most important. That's the bit that will be showing. Just using my fingers there to sort of spread out the glue underneath. Press it all down nice and flat. So much easier to do that with wallpaper when you're, you've got the sort of piece in your hand rather than working in a small area. Cut around that side and push that down as well. And this is the side that's going to be hidden beside the window, the side you can't sort of see when you're looking into the room. Just hold that into the light and make sure you're nice and flat and smooth up there, which we are. Looks nice. I really love this paper. Again, I'll leave that to dry in that nice sunny spot. And it's 25 to 6 in the evening now, so I think I'm going to call it a day. And we'll continue tomorrow. And then I've been filming now for two or three days, so I'll call it a day tomorrow. We'll see what we can get done tomorrow morning. And then I'll try and finish up the video so I can actually get this on. And then anything we haven't checked off of our list. In fact, let's update our list now that over there in the sun and I've been adding to it as well as I've gone along because obviously I hadn't painted the ceiling which I thought I'd done so I added that on so let's cross off paper chimney breast so we've still got on there make hearth but now I've, I'm using that old marble one so we don't have to make it but I'll leave it on there until I've painted it and then fit half, fit chimney breast, make fire surround and fit. So again, we haven't got to make the fire surround, but we will have to fit it. And then it's the um, skirting and coving. So probably the skirting and coving will leave until the next episode. But we'll get this chimney breast fitted tomorrow. Get the other coat of paint on. I'm really looking forward to seeing how that all looks in place. So, have a lovely evening, and I'll see you in the morning. So I've just taken out all of the tins and packets and things, and I just wanted to show you how the floor looks now. And I'm really pleased with that. I think the colours look really nice together. That walnut against the teal green goes really well. And once the skirting and coving in is in here, that's really going to set it off as well. But I want to do a little bit more work on the chimney breast now. So I'll take you back into the craft room. And I just want to start by painting out these bricks inside the chimney breast. And I'm going to use the antique white for that again. The same as I used for the uh, surround. This bit isn't going to be seen, but I just want to start along there so you can't see any of the brick once the surround is in place. And I'm not going to go along that top edge just because that's still got a little bit of charcoal on it and I don't want that to mix in with the paint. And that bit won't be seen anyway. So I don't know if you can see that on camera, but although that's given a nice coverage, you can still see the shapes of the bricks through there. And I'm purposely not working the paint into some of those sort of gaps between the bricks, just because I want it to show that there are still bricks there. And I should just do two light coats on this. Okay, so that can now be left to dry. So this is the fire surround that I did one coat of paint on yesterday. So that's now completely dry. And I'm not sure if you can pick that out on camera, but it hasn't given a very good coverage. 
but I still think two or three coats will do it. But what I'm actually going to start by doing is just going over this with some wire wool and that will just really gently sand away the rough parts of that paint. Now I've got a glove on here just because I um, slipped my finger with some scissors earlier so I don't want the little bits of the wool getting into my cut and I've also got the window open here because this does create quite a bit of um, dust. But I just want to go over that really gently and then once I've been over it I'll take it out into the garden and get rid of the dust. And that's just flattening out that first layer of paint and creating a nicer base for the next coat. Okay, that should do it. I'll now go and brush off that dust out in the garden and then I can do a second coat of paint. Okay, so here goes with the second coat. That's given a much nicer coverage already. So that's the second coat on there, and that's actually covered a lot better than I thought it would. I thought I'd need two or three coats, but I actually quite like that. And I think what I might do once that's completely dried is just sand back in a few of the areas, maybe over the embellishments there, because it doesn't need to look too pristine. I want it to look like a, an old fireplace that has been there for quite a while and just had a quick lick of paint to tidy it up a bit. But yeah, really pleased with that. And then, if you remember, I couldn't do anything with the hearth yesterday because it was still damp, because I cleaned it off and because it's plaster, it just sort of soaked up the water. But that's now completely dried. So I'm also going to do a couple of coats of the antique white on there. So I just painted around the little lip underneath there and then I've attached it to a piece of uh, masking tape on my card. And I said two coats for this, but I think this may just need the one coat because that's going on really nicely. Okay, so I'm going to leave that to dry as well. So the paint on the inside of the chimney breast is now dry, so I want to actually attach this into place inside the room. So I'm going to apply the glue to the back of the chimney breast. And then I just want to put a little bit on the bottom of each of these sort of legs as well and then they'll be glued in place on the floor. Okay, so let's get that in there carefully and I haven't measured because I'll sort of use this as the main one and then the one below can sort of go in the same position as this just pull that over, press it down and against the wall. I just want to press that paper against the wall as well. So that's sitting nice and flat. And there's no real way of securing this inside so without damaging the walls. So I'm just giving it a good firm press and I'll just sort of hold on to that until the glue begins to take. And I've probably got about a centimetre after the window frame in that corner. And then I've got this nice space here where I can have a chest of drawers or something. There's a little bit of gap in at the top there. along the line of the roof but I'll be applying the coving around there 
as we did in the study. So that will all be hidden. So that's now drying nicely in place. I made a couple of little marks on the wall here where I was removing the glue from along the join. So I'll just very carefully touch that in with some of the teal green paint. And now I want to get the hearth and the fireplace around in place. So once the paint had dried on the fire surround, I used a 500 grade sandpaper just to sand back in a few areas. And I really like the effect that's given. It's really sort of picked out those, you know, the raised bits, the embellishments. And it now looks like a sort of old, well used fireplace. I did the same with the hearth and I now want to attach the hearth into place. So there's the hearth and that was just one coat of paint and that's got a really nice finish on it. So that will actually sit just in front of the chimney breast there like that. And then where you've got that gap at the back, I've just cut a couple of pieces of three millimeter thick sheet wood to make it as high as the hearth. And that will just tuck in there so that there's no gap in the back there. So I'll start by putting that little plinth into place. I've just put a little bit of glue on the bottom of there. I'll just press that into place. Make sure that's pushed in as far as it will go. Now I'll just put some glue on the bottom of the hearth. And then I'm just judging by eye that there's the same amount overhanging at each side. So that looks about right to me. Press that into place. And I've seen that little bit of glue I've got in the corner there, so I'll just grab a cocktail stick and remove that. So when I first tried this around into place, it wasn't quite sitting right against the back wall and it is a little bit warped and that's obviously where it's been glued into place before and then I've removed it. But I sanded the back and that made it a little bit better, although there is still a little bit of movement there. So what I'll do is I'll glue it into place so it looks nice from the side that I'm actually looking in and then I can do a little bit of filling along the top there on that other side once it's dried into place. Because it's made from resin I don't want to start sort of really trying to push it out of shape because I'm worried that it might actually crack. So I'll just glue it in as best as I can and then I can do any filling along the top there in any visible areas once it's dry. So again I'm just going to apply some glue to the back into place there. Again I'm just checking that I've got the same amount sort of overhanging on the inside edge. So I'm going to press it down on this side first. As long as it's not looking too sort of gappy on this side where I look into the room I'll be quite happy with that. If there's a gap along that edge, I'm not too worried because it won't be seen from the front. In fact, it would be very difficult to look in and actually see that even from that far window. So I'm just holding this into place again until the glue begins to take. So that's actually glued into place quite nicely and the only gap in that you can see is along the top edge sort of over on that left hand side. But I'm actually not too worried about that because I know when I've got things standing on there that won't be noticeable at all. And that's glued nicely into place along this um, right hand side. So really pleased with how that looks. Like I said earlier, the coving and skirting is really going to set that off. But I think this has been quite a long episode now, so we'll leave that until the next episode. We'll get the skirting and coving done. 
and maybe have a look at that um, printed fabric as well. And then after that I want to actually move down into the entrance hall and landing and actually fit some staircases. And I know a couple of people have asked about that as well, so we'll start doing that. And it's like I said in an earlier episode, I sort of don't just want to concentrate on one room at a time. I'd like to try and get the decorating done with a few tutorials in between, just to sort of mix it up a bit and keep it interesting. OK, so that's it for now. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'm really pleased with how the bedroom is looking and I can't wait to start adding the furniture and accessories in there. Now, before I go, I just want to tell you about a new page on Miniatura's website. The page is called Miniatura Online and it's basically a comprehensive list of miniature craftspeople from all around the world. Simply click on one of the profile images and you'll find details about the maker along with some lovely images of their work. You'll also find their contact details and links to their websites or shops. Now Andy at Miniatura told me that it's still early days but there are already some really fantastic makers signed up and he hopes the search engine will become a really useful addition to the Miniaturists online toolkit. Now if you're a miniature maker and would like to promote your business, signing up is really easy. You'll find all the details at the bottom of the page. And for £50 a year, that's less than a pound a week, you'll be advertising your business to thousands of miniature enthusiasts. I just signed up myself yesterday and I'm delighted to be part of this page. And whilst you're on the page, do stop to have a browse around as there's some really great features and articles. There's a fantastic blog and you can find out all about the latest shows. So I'll pop a link to the website below and I hope you'll go over and take a look. OK, so that really is it for now. Take care and I'll see you again soon. Bye.